Kunzang Churin is the first Bhutanese women writer to write in English. Today, she lives with her Swiss husband at Tang Valley in Bumthang. We visited Ugin Choling for a special conversation with her. Hello, Kusambo. How are you today? Fine, fine, fine. How are you? Good luck. Take a long time to plant here? Yes, yes. How long has your family been living here? Like? We know that for the f uh, the first time we hear about this place is uh, in the autobiography of Long Chen Ramjamba, who was in the here in the 14th century, and he, he, this place was selected and named by him mm -hmm. as Ugin Chui Ling, mm -hmm. and we uh, include it's included in the eight original Lings mm -hmm. of Long Chen Ramjamba. Mm -hmm. So it was. At that time, we don't know whether there was a house or anything. We just know that he lived in a cave up there. Later on, we know that one of our ancestors actually lived here. And that was around the time, I think, 15th century. We don't know exactly when, but 15th century. And ever since then, this has, uh, house has always been with the same uh, family, so the descendants. And up to now, we count 20 generations. So we've uh, witnessed a lot of changes, not we, but our family and our, uh, has witnessed a lot of changes in Bhutan because we were here already before Bhutan was unified in the 17th century. And we've lived through all the changes. We've witnessed actually. We've been showing such a beautiful palace, Lander. How, how was your childhood uh, growing up in this courtyard? I just want to say that we don't refer to this as a zong or a palace or a padang. We refer to this as a <coughs> naksang or sometimes even people call it a gempa, Ugin Chuling gempa, they say. And uh, the English translation, the closest English translation we could find to, a, to this establishment is manor. So we use the word manor more often, or Ugin Chuling Naksang. And um, I was born here in, the, in one of the rooms down there, and I was living here until I went to school in 1962. So I must have just been touching uh, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't remember anything spectacular, or anything uh, worth uh, really talking about as, uh, as a child growing up here. But I think the, um, one of the things that maybe was of interest was that I was in this many generations, I was one of the first girls mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And um, so while I was uh, here, I had to have a name change. So I was brought up as a boy. Oh, oh, okay. That's interesting. So I was born and I was given the name Kunzong Children, mm -hmm. but because of some illness and things like this, the Lama said, oh, she should have been a boy. So I was given a boy's name and dressed as a boy. And you can see pictures of me when I was the oldest, where I just look like my brothers. Mm -hmm. So I did whatever the boys did. I played the games. I always was uh, part of their gang, you know, doing oh. all the things <laughs> and trying to beat them in their own games and things like this. So it was... Um, a childhood like any other child growing up at that time, nothing special. Mm -hmm. And perhaps uh, something that was um, special in a way was the school that we had here. Mm -hmm. It was a private school because at that time there were no schools except monastic mm -hmm. schools. So my father had a school just for his children and some of the village children. So the and school was located here? Yes, the oh, school was nice located in, at some time it was in this old building. Oh. We moved around okay. and I think the school went on for two or three years. How many students were there? There were about uh, eight or nine of us oh. and they were all boys and I was the only girl but I had to assume to be a boy yes. because <laughs> I, was, uh, I, was, uh, I had a very uh, fearsome mm -hmm. name of a very fearsome deity. I was called Doji Jikje oh. and that was you know, a very fearful name. But inside, I knew I was always a girl, so I was always mixing with the women and all the activities, women activities, for instance. I spent a lot of time in these two rooms. We were the weaving rooms, mm -hmm. and most of the, all of the weavers, except for one, was a woman. Mm -hmm. 
And so I was always there, but then I had to play the tough games, like jumping and running and, you know, chasing pigs around yeah. the village. Riding horses, well? Huh? Riding horses. Wow. <laughs> but riding horses was necessary, and uh, um, because we traveled quite a bit within the area, and then we went every winter to Lunzi, mm -hmm. so we had to learn to ride horses. And my fast father actually personally taught us how to ride and things like that. Not because I was a boy, but because because I was brought up as a boy, but it was a necessity if you had to ride. Either you walked or you rode. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, it seems like you lost your parents at a very young age. So was, it, uh, was your childhood difficult? Or? For the nine, ten years that I was here, I was in fact, uh, it, I was very privileged in many ways. And I lost my father in the year that I went to school. And then I was in a convent school in Kalingpong. Mm -hmm. And uh, two years later, I m lost my mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, thinking back now, it was difficult because suddenly there's this gap, this mm -hmm. void in your life, and you don't have anyone to call your mother and father. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not a special experience mm -hmm. because there's so many children who are orphans. And I, I just moved from being a privileged girl, having um, you know, a house and parents to being an orphan and I think that uh, that was quite hard but the fact that uh, we were living in um, boarding schools where every child was treated the same I think that helped me to live a normal life and not always grow up on the fact that I was an orphan and it was always the winter holidays the long holidays mm -hmm. when we didn't know where we were going and who was going to take us so that was difficult and uh, it's more difficult now thinking about it, you know. I feel sorry for myself as, oh, poor me, you know, <laughs> I grew up. Uh, since you were mentioning uh, you had a private school here, mm -hmm. like with just eight uh, students, mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. And then how, how was, uh, after that you went for your studies mm -hmm. to uh, Galingpong. Mm -hmm. So how did you adjust it like, to this transition of your life? It was a huge transition and when I now think about it, I say, oh, gosh, we must have uh, some fantastic resilience mm -hmm. in us mm -hmm. to be able to transit from this secluded. school, secluded rural school to a school, mm -hmm. to be in a school where we didn't know the language, we didn't know even what the people looked like, you know, to go there and to just go on from there. Mm -hmm. Because the school here, we learned mostly the traditional things mm -hmm. like kaka ganga, the mm -hmm. alphabets. And we just had reached the level of, I had just reached the level of uh, being able to just read Dorji mm -hmm. uh, which is the first primer in Bhutanese, uh, when, when we learn Bhutanese. And suddenly I had to learn alphabets, uh, not Kakagana anymore, but A, B, C, D. And my father knew that we would be going to school, so he actually hired a tutor who was supposed to have uh, known English, but all he knew was the alphabets. Mm -hmm. So when we were interviewed in, in the schools, the nuns asked us what we, we just kept on saying A, B, C, D, you know. <laughs> so that was all. It was a very, very difficult transition. But I think human beings are such that when you're in a situation, you just go forward. Mm -hmm. When I think about it now, you know, it seemed much more difficult. Mm -hmm. But every, uh, you know, every situation is there and human beings somehow just adjust and move on and, uh, you know, adapt. The most difficult was not knowing the language. I didn't know any word of Hindi, Nepali or English. All I knew was Bumtangka. Uh, and you didn't get very far with Bumtangka in Kalimpong in the 1960s. The f uh, situation was made even worse by the fact that there were already Bhutanese girls who were there before me in the school, but none of them spoke Bumtangha and I didn't speak Tsongkha. So I was in silence for several months. So I didn't speak to anyone and nobody could uh, talk to me. So that was very difficult. Yeah. And then it seems like you have studied abroad, Mala, like most of the time from Kalingpong, then I believe you went to Delhi also. Yes. So how was your uh, experience? La? Did it help you to become a stronger woman? La? Um, you know, um, if you think about it, I mean, you're much younger than me, so you don't know about this, but um, what the school lacked, in spite of all the privileges, and I always consider myself very, very fortunate to be able to go to these good schools in Kalimpong, and later I moved to Darjeeling. But there was very little career counselling or even to help us to 
or you know what what is the next level you know I think most of the girls of my classmates were there were some who wanted to really study but some were there basically to have the basic education and move on and become wives hmm? and uh, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do after school but I knew at least that much to know that you know the next step is college mm -hmm. so I just automatically without having this great big interest mm -hmm. in going to college I just said I'll go to college mm -hmm. and in those days we were very very fortunate that the government provided mm -hmm. colleges you know gave us colleges mm -hmm. if you just qualified mm -hmm. and um, so I chose a the college in Delhi mm -hmm. because I knew I knew somebody from there yeah. a girl who was there before me and um, I didn't even know what subject I wanted to do mm -hmm. you know I said maybe education and uh, something like this I wanted to study mm -hmm. but the college I chose didn't offer education as mm -hmm. a subject so I chose so, uh, psychology mm -hmm. I couldn't even spell the word psychology you know mm -hmm. but it was something that you had to do. I didn't want to do economics, I didn't want to do mathematics or philosophy. So psychology seemed like a good subject to choose and that's how, so that's how little guidance we had. And I think already the fact that I didn't have a family to talk with and get advice, I just went on very bravely pretending that I knew what I was doing and that I was very independent. And uh, after three years of psychology, what do you do? What are your options? No. So then, um, much later, after I had married and had the children, I had the opportunity to go to the U.S. And that time, I chose my subject, sociology, mm -hmm. because I've, that was what I was really interested mm -hmm. in, societies and people and mm -hmm. cultures and things like this. Mm -hmm. So I did a combination of sociology with anthropology, and that was much more um, fulfilling and much more satisfying and much more enjoyable. And then, uh, can I ask a personal question also? Yes. Uh, how did you uh, meet your husband? La? Was it a love uh, at first sight? Um, <laughs> love at first sight, I wouldn't say. Of course, it was uh, uh, in the 1970s, mid 1970s, there were very few people who actually married foreigners. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't choose to marry a foreigner, mm -hmm. but after I finished college, um, that time the government of Bhutan had a very wise uh, program. I felt it was a very good program uh, and it really was to meet a situation that was prevalent in the country and that was most of the people of my age had been out to study like I had been out for 14 years you know continuously from kindergarten right up to college so the government somebody very wise in the government decided that we'd be completely disoriented that we wouldn't know the realities of what the, the country was going through, what the rural communities were doing. So there was a very good program. I would recommend it even now. It was called National Service. And after you finished college, before you were employed, you had to go into this National Service. And we were sent to a rural area. It was to really to ground us and to make us aware of what was happening, to send us to the rural areas and do some kind of hands-on project. So many of the boys in my group were sent to uh, rural areas in the east and south where they were digging tunnels, for irrigation tunnels, making toilets and things like this. And I was sent to Bumtang to work with a rural development project which was run by the Swiss. And I came there and uh, I was just told to teach kind of adult literacy because many of the tr uh, trainees who were mostly agriculture and forestry trainees, none of them, they were all in the 18, 19, 20, even 25, 26 years old people, they didn't have any education. They were all illiterate. Uh, they didn't have literacy or they had never been to school and they were being trained by the Swiss. So I was to fill that gap of being um, the communicator, but yes, the bridge to bridge the two. So I was supposed to teach the children, uh, the guys, mm -hmm. children, they want children, to teach the guys some literacy and numeracy and teach the Swiss mm -hmm. some Bhutanese culture and Zonka so that they could communicate. Mm -hmm. So that's how I was brought to this um, project and there I met my husband. The first encounter was already a year before. Mm -hmm. I'd come from, my, I was still in college and I, um, I was at that time studying in Delhi and I'd come here mm -hmm. for my holidays and I was going back. 1975, 
you won't believe it. They weren't, there were no buses, there were no cars. Mm -hmm. The only car that was available and which went sometimes to Thimphu and back was the Swiss project, they had one car. Mm -hmm. So either I had to wait for the post, mm -hmm. post jeep, mm -hmm. which carried the post and the salaries of the, uh, mm -hmm. the government mm -hmm. um, civil servants around, it did a weekly or a bi-weekly or two week I don't remember, but we had to wait for that red jeep which came. We knew it was a male jeep because it's red. And if you are lucky, you could get a seat on that. Mm -hmm. And if you miss that, mm -hmm. then either you had to wait and wait and wait and wait for a mm -hmm. transport. Mm -hmm. And there was no, uh, there was a BGTS, mm -hmm. Bhutan Government Transport mm -hmm. Service, which was a truck. And I had missed that and I had to go to back to college. Mm -hmm. And everybody said the Swiss have a car, mm -hmm. which goes quite often. Mm -hmm. So I went to ask for the car mm -hmm. and uh, the project manager and my husband refused to give me a lift. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so that was an unpleasant encounter. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, it's just one time yeah. I meet this man and he's been unpleasant. And so you he, know, was he quite rude? He just said there's no transport oh, okay. and we don't <laughs> provide transport for anyone. Mm -hmm. you know? So being Swiss and trying to be very fair and mm -hmm. think nobody gets mm -hmm. special lift and things like this. And I had forgotten all about it. And then a year later, I finished college. Mm -hmm. And when I was sent to this project, he happened to be my boss. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is the man who refused me a <laughs> <laughs> seat, uh, seat in the car. But then over the years, we, I mean, over the, not, it wasn't years, over the months we were working together. And that's, so it wasn't love at first sight, yeah. okay? <laughs> so it was uh, slowly growing. And in those days, it was uh, um, quite a foolish thing for me to do is to, mm -hmm. you know, get attracted to a foreigner because in those days there were very few yes, people yes, who had yes, actually married. Yes. To uh, mm -hmm. a year ahead, the project manager, mm -hmm. uh, Fritz Maurer, had married a Bhutanese mm -hmm. uh, woman. Mm -hmm. So he had set the precedent mm -hmm. and then we then decided to marry a year later and um, it wasn't straightforward or it wasn't easy, but we managed to get all the required. Mm -hmm. So was there any objection from the family? Lord? Well, as I didn't really have a family, mm -hmm. but uh, it did shock my relatives mm -hmm. and uh, nobody really um, said you cannot marry this mm -hmm. man, but they all discouraged and there are a lot of uh, details of how this discouragement came mm -hmm. from all sort mm -hmm. of ways and in all sort of means, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, by that time, I was I had finished college. I'd mm -hmm. lived a very independent life. I was way, and by the time I was doing my national service, I was even earning a salary. Mm -hmm. So I felt very confident, and I said, "This is my life. I have to live it myself. Mm -hmm. And whatever the consequences are, I will uh, be. I will be responsible for my uh, actions." Mm -hmm.